appreciate him coming and, and talking as well, too. Today we're just going to try to focus on some of our, uh, our utilization of some of our existing forage resources uh, and kind of pull that together uh, so that uh, it kind of makes things a little bit more efficient. And we've already got things kind of in place that got things done. Yeah, I'd like to thank Tad for inviting me to come over and speak to you all and I'd like to thank David for inviting me to come over and do a fencing workshop this summer. That was a, that was a lot of fun. A little bit hot, but, but a lot of fun. Before I get started, I want to recognize Bart. Bart, could you stand up? This, this guy won the National Forage Spokesperson Contest, and that's no small feat. And so make sure you can cor congratulate him. If you want to watch his presentation, it is on our YouTube channel. And um, I can't remember how many times it's been watched, five or 600 times already. So um, make sure and take a look at that. And you can get to the YouTube channel just by searching KY Forages YouTube. And it'll be the first thing that pops up on the, on the list. So Bart beat one of my old producers from, from Virginia, um, Bob Wilbanks, who happens to be a, a retired veterinarian. So it was really stiff competition. And, um, but, I, but I do think Bart edged him out in the end. So congratulations, Bart. Um, Ray, you asked me to mention something. I'm trying to remember. Okay. Yeah, we, we commonly think of um, cost share programs as being for infrastructure like uh, watering systems and um, subdivision of pastures and so forth. But there are programs for for reseeding pastures and applying amendments. Who, who's our NRCS person here today? So if, if you want details on those pro programs, please see him back table right in the middle. Um, and he can give you details on those, those cost share programs. And that, those are a great resource. Um, those are a great resource, especially if you're just getting started in, in controlled or managed or rotational grazing. I mean, that really helps you um, speed up your adoption of that practice if you can participate in some of those cost share programs. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, my, my talk's going to be a lot less technical than Sam's was. So, um, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to talk about using what you already have on your farm, the forages that you already have. And um, in, in the past, you know, in the beginning of my career, I was much much more apt to suggest that people would kill a pasture and reseed it. And I've kind of gotten away from that over the years um, for a number of reasons. But, um, and I really think it's more important to focus on management of existing pastures rather than, than complete renovations. Not in every case, but in, in many cases. When I was a young man just out of graduate school, I went to graduate school at the University of Kentucky, and I've, I got a job right out of graduate school in, at Virginia Tech. And uh, I had the good fortune of meeting Mike Henry. And Mike Henry was a senior extension agent, like David, had, had a little bit of years in. And uh, he took me under his wing. And you know, when you go to graduate school for a long time, I mean, I was in college for over a decade. You know, you think you know a lot, right? And then you get to the real world and you figure out you don't know quite as much as you thought you knew. And Mike took me under his wing and, and as soon as I got to the southern Piedmont region of Virginia and, and really was a formative person in my career. And uh, one of the things that Mike taught me early on was that we can plant whatever we want in a pasture. But in four to five years, it's going to be a mixture of... of you know what we planted, usually tall fescue and some orchard grass and some Kentucky bluegrass and a little bit of white clover and then some summer annual grasses like crabgrass. So we can plant what we want, but in about five years, we're, we're going to have a mixture of things in that pasture. And, and there no truer words have ever been spoken. We often think of pastures as, as monocultures, so that's just one plant growing in that pasture, but really they're complex mixtures of many things. And, and those things include things that we planted like orchard grass and tall fescue, um, and then things like chicory that may volunteer. Plantains, we often think of plantain as a weed, but animals will often graze that in pastures. 
So there's weedy forbs and then uh, clover that come into our pastures either via frost seeding like Ray talked about or, or naturally occur like the uh, shorter stature Dutch white clovers. And then improved legumes like red clover and, and alfalfa and, and uh, annual lespedeza that may have to be reseeded from time to time. But the point that I want to make is that pastures are not monocultures. They're really complex mixtures of a lot of different plants, including some things that we consider weeds in that pasture. And the, the focus of my talk today is, is what do we do with these kind of these mature pastures, and how do we manage them to optimize production within our grazing system? So not necessarily maximize, but optimize. So normally a, a biological maximum, when we talk about maximizing something, is not economically a good idea. So today I'm going to talk about several different things. And there'll be a little bit of, of repeat as we go through the talks, and that's not bad. So Ray talked about some of the things I'm going to talk about. Edwin's going to talk about some of the things I'm going to talk about after lunch. And, um, and, and hearing it more than once is going to kind of reinforce it as pretty important uh, when you think about managing a grazing system. So we're going to talk a little bit about soil, pH, and liming, and soil fertility. And Edwin will have a much more detailed talk on that after lunch. We're going to talk about forage plant growth how forage plants grow and how they respond to grazing management. That's an extremely important tool in managing pastures. And then we'll talk about grazing timing, how, how it can impact what's dominant within that pasture and how we can shift botanical composition by when and how hard we graze a pasture. And then we'll talk about uh, nitrogen fertilization, how we can use that to shift both growth and species composition in pastures with, with very precise applications of nitrogen during different times of the year. And then we're going to kind of put all these concepts together into two or three examples of, of manipulating botanical composition of pastures through management. And then I'll just finish up by, by reinforcing some of the things that Ray talked about, talking about how important legumes are in grassland ecosystems. You know, when, when nitrogen is a dollar a pound, Legumes are really, really important. And as we move forward, we need to remember this. We have, tend to have a short memory, but we need to remember high nitrogen prices. And anything that we can do to kind of wean ourselves off of nitrogen fertilizer in grazing systems is going to be pretty important as we move forward. And then we'll talk about, just, uh, just real briefly, Ray did a super job of talking about using improved varieties in grazing systems and, and where they may fit. So, so I, I always like to start out and talk about indicator plants, and that's a plant that's going to tell you something, something's not quite right in my pasture. And um, the one that we most commonly think of would be broom straw or broom sage, right? We see that and we say, well, you know, I need lime on that field, or I need phosphorus, or, or Jimmy Henning actually did some work that showed that he needed potassium. But some, somehow it's indicating that something's not quite right. And, and the point that I want to make with indicator plants is that they're okay to use, but, but really when we start talking about soil fertility, you know, what we really need to be doing is taking a soil test, right? So I don't have to guess whether I needed potassium in that pasture to get rid of my broom sage or whether I just needed phosphorus or whether I just needed a, a, a ton or two of lime on that pasture. And the only way we know that is if we take a soil sample. And... Um, and the accuracy of the results are going to depend on how representative your sample is. So we need to make sure that it represents what we're sampling well. And we want to take um, samples that are 20 acres or less, so we want a, a sample to represent 20 acres of pasture or less. Say I've got a pasture boundary that's got 60 acres, I need to take three samples from that. And the way I kind of take that sample is I, I divide that pasture up into to, um, like uh, unit. So for example, if this was 60 acres, maybe I would take um, one sample on the hill slopes, one on the bottom area, and one on the other side of the hill slopes. The, the idea is that we divide it up into kind of like uh, topographic characteristics. And we want 15 to 20 cores per sample. We kind of take them in a zigzag pattern. 
and I know this is a review for a lot of you, but, but I can't emphasize enough, it's, it's important to take your time when you're getting a soil sample and get it one that really represents that, that pasture or hay field well. Always use a soil probe, and in the past we've said, well, you can use a shovel, but it's just hard to get a good sample with a shovel. So um, get a soil probe from your local extension agent. You guys have them to loan out, right? And, um, and we want to sample to a four-inch depth. And I, I know that sounds silly, me standing up here saying sample to four-inch depth, but I go to an extension meeting, and I'll say, how deep should we be soil sampling pastures? I'll get answers from, from two to 12 inches. Our soil test uh, calibrations are based on four inches. So we need to make sure that we sample to a depth of four inches. And then we want to avoid atypical areas, and those are areas where animals congregate at in that pasture. So where we fed hay, around the water, around a mineral feeder, around shade areas, uh, around a pond, we don't want to include those samples in there because they tend, animals tend to concentrate nutrients in those areas. And if we include those cores in that sample, we tend to elevate falsely our sample that represents that entire pasture. And then we want to make sure we do our paperwork, and that's where your extension agents are really important. So make sure you get the paperwork filled out right so that you get a, a good recommendation for what you need in that pasture. And um, most importantly is the results from soil tests come to your extension agents. So they can help you uh, interpret those values, figure out how much you, lime you need, and they'll adjust that lime recommendation for your local lime sources, which is really important because not all lime is created equally, and Edwin, I'm sure, will talk about that in his presentation. Um, just wanted to point out this, it's a relatively new publication that uh, Edwin and I wrote a couple years ago, and they're available on the back table there, and they, it just brings out uh, in nice bulleted format all the things that we just talked about in terms of getting a good soil sample from hay fields and pastures. All right, I'm, I'm going to go through this kind of quick because Edmund's going to talk on this um, after lunch in detail on soil acidity and liming. Um, but, but I do want to mention that, that soil acidity is still a major factor limiting forage production, not just in Kentucky, but the whole southeastern United States. Our soils tend to drift down in pH over time. And that has two-fold effect. It, it impacts nutrient availability in the soil. And the second one that's really important is it impacts nitrogen fixation in the legumes. So as, as that pH drops, our legumes become more, less efficient at producing or fixing nitrogen from the air into a plant available form. And this is just in a, a diagram that shows the availability of different nutrients in the soil at different pHs. So, so we go from very acid to very alkaline, and you know, ideally we'd be in this range of six to seven, and if you look at our major nutrients, and the wider that band is, the more plant available that nutrient is. If you look at nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, when we get in that range of six to seven, that's when all those macronutrients are going to be the most plant available. So liming's going to neutralize soil acidity, and, and Edwin will go into details on, on how that works, or in some cases, some cases, some products, how it doesn't work. Um, and it also supplies calcium and magnesium. And these are just general guidelines, but in, in general for a grass legume mixture, which we would have in most of our pastures, we want to be in that pH range of 6 to 6.4. We want to, when we start drifting down towards 6, then that means we need to probably put a little bit of lime on to kind of bump it back up to that 6.4. Now, if we're growing a grass alfalfa hay stand, then we really need to be above 6.5, and when we start out, we want to be at least 6.8 or 7 um, to start with in that uh, grass alfalfa mixture. So I've got a list of forages here and their tolerance to soil acidity, and, uh, and it ranges from, from excellent tolerance to kind of poor tolerance in, in terms of soil acidity. So if I've got if I've got a pasture that's low in fertility or so low in soil acidity, the best thing to do is lime that pasture, but sometimes we don't have that, that choice. So, so look, looking for things that are more tolerant to soil acidity, for example, if we look at crabgrass, we have good tolerance to soil acidity. We look at um, red clover, it's only fair. So um, I may want to go with a 
a Lespedeza, like annual Lespedeza or Cerecia Lespedeza, which has a much better tolerance to soil acidity. The, the point that I want to make is that sometimes we need to match plants to, to a pasture if we can't adjust that soil fertility in that pasture. Ideally, we would adjust that soil fertility. This is just a little piece of data from a study that I did a number of years ago, and, and we looked at um, the impact of lime and fertilizer on Cerecia lespedeza. And that lime and fertilizer was applied according to soil test at seeding. And we always think of Cerecia lespedeza as, as very tolerant to low fertility and, and a low pH or acidic soils. But, but the impact that this lime and fertilizer had in this particular study was tremendous. So this particular piece of land came out of a um, uh, forest area and uh, was extremely low in pH. We were around 4.9 almost no phosphorus, and then kind of medium minus low plus for, for potash was the initial stands. So we planted everything the same, and you can see the difference in the stands. So this was fertilized where he is with the forage harvester, and this was not fertilized at, um, at seeding. And over this three-year period that we have on here, uh, 2012 to 2014, these bars had no lime or fertilizer at seeding, these bars had lime or fertilizer. So the difference or the impact that that lime and fertilizer at establishment had on that Cerecia lespedeza production was tremendous. And the reason I'm showing you this is that Cerecia lespedeza is tolerant to poor fertility in low pH, but it still responds when we improve soil fertility. And most of our forages would be that responsive or even more as we move forward. I always like to talk about, um, when we talk about soil fertility, uh, Liebig's Law of the Minimum. And um, what that's saying is that the level of plant production can be no greater than whatever's the most limiting essential plant growth factor. So if we look at nutrients, we can kind of think of it as a barrel. If we look at nutrients, each one of these staves in the barrel is, is a nutrient. Whatever's the most limiting nutrient in that production system is gonna hold overall pasture production or hay production back. And so we've got to figure out what's limiting and then fix that. And we fix that with a fertilizer application or a lime application if it's soil acidity that's holding back overall production. The reason I like to show this is that I think it's important to understand that when we think about a soil fertility program, we can't just pick and choose what nutrients we want to put on. We've got to have a really a targeted approach and identify those ones that are restricting growth and production in that pasture and then apply those. So, um, so it's really important to figure out what your most limiting nutrients are, and that's what soil testing does for us. Okay, I'm going to change, change gears a little bit, and, and we talked about kind of lime and, and soil fertility, and that's really important to provide a good forage base. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about forage plant growth and, and rotational grazing. So this was um, a summary of research that was put together in a, a uh, publication from the uh, NRCS. So they went through and summarized a whole bunch of controlled or scientific studies comparing continuous and rotational stocking. So continuous stocking is when we just put the animals in there and leave them in there. Rotational stocking is when we put the animals in and then we move them to another area of the pasture um, when, when they graze to a certain height, uh, the forage is down to a certain height. What they found was that when we went from a continuous to a rotational stocking system, that we increased productivity by 30% on average. That's a pretty big deal. There's not many things that we can do in agriculture you know, if, if I'm a grain crops guy and I'm getting another bushel or two out of, a, of productivity, I'm pretty happy. I'm talking about 30% increase in productivity, and I'm not even asking you to buy anything here. I'm just asking you to start to manage your pastures. That's a pretty big deal. There's not many things that we can do in agriculture that's going to give us a bump of, of 25 or 30% in productivity. This was a quote from myself, actually. And uh, shortly after I came to Kentucky, I started to write a column for the Cow Country News. And um, this was a quote from that column, and it said, after almost two decades of attending and teaching grazing schools, it finally dawned on me. 
that we make implementing rotational stocking too hard. And, and I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of truth to that. You know, we, we get up and we stand in front of you and we say, well, you need to divide your pastures up into 10, 10 little pieces and you need to rotate every three days. And um, yeah, maybe that's ideal. But look, on most farms, if I just close some gates, I've got a rotational stocking system. And, and that's important. That's important just to get started. So you don't have to spend a lot of money. You just have to close some gates. And then when it grazes that pasture down, open that gate up and let them go. And it, over time, you'll start to see a benefit to that. And then you'll say, well, what if I took that larger pasture and I made it into two little ones? Boy, I can do that really easy with some temporary fe electric fencing. And, um, and, and you're, off, you're off with the rotational stocking system. Talk just a little bit about forage plant growth. And this is a, this, this talk is just a mix of a whole bunch of different topics, right? And, and forage plant growth is one of those topics. We have a whole topic on just forage plant growth in the grazing school, a whole hour of presentation. So I would encourage you to come to the grazing schools if you can. The closest one to you will be in Versailles, about an hour and a half from here, maybe an hour and 40 minutes. Um, and that will be not this spring, but in this coming fall. So I'll talk just a little bit about photosynthesis. And um, photosynthesis is the most important biochemical process on Earth. So without photosynthesis, none of us would be sitting in this room today. Um, and all it does is convert light energy from the sun into to chemical energy, and it does that through the plant. And this is the, this is the chemical equation. So we take carbon dioxide from the air, water from the soil, and convert it into sugars in the plant and carbohydrates. And then an important um, byproduct for us is oxygen. And uh, this all takes place in a specialized part of the plant cell called the chloroplast. That's the green that gives the has the chlorophyll that gives the plant the green color. And the whole process is driven by light energy from the sun. I, I like to think of photosynthesis in a grazing system as a, kind of a big solar panel. I like to think of the farm as a big solar panel, right? The bigger the solar panel, the more production I'm going to have. So when I start to manage grazing and I manage how closely we graze that pasture, I'm managing the size of that solar panel. So if I graze that forage right down to the soil surface, that solar panel becomes really small. And it's going to take that pasture a lot longer to regrow. If I leave four or five inches, I'm leaving leaf area in that pasture, and that solar panel is going to be a lot bigger. It's going to collect more sunlight, and that regrowth is going to be much more rapid. That's the whole basis of rotational stocking is managing how close we graze and then how long that pasture gets rested between grazing events. And it's all about managing that solar panel on your farm really important that we have a good solar panel. So if we have bare areas in our pasture or, or areas where we fed hay, it's important to get something that we want growing on those areas. We want the whole farm to be covered in that solar panel. Just a little bit about plant morphology and plant, don't get lost in that word. Morphology is just a fancy word for the physical structure of that plant. How's it grow? Does it grow low to the ground? Does it grow upright? Does it have a tap root or a, or a fibrous root system? If we look at grasses, we have two types of grasses. We have what we call our bunch grasses. They include things like tall fescue and orchard grass. If you ever looked at an orchard grass field as it starts to thin out over time, you'll see clumps of orchard grass in that field. It looks like a solid sod at, at the beginning because those clumps are really close together. And then as they start to die, there gets space in between. We can actually see those clumps. In tall fescues, the same way, it's a clump type grass, also or a bunch type grass. A lot of tillers that, that kind of grow upward in those, um, in those types of grasses, and we call those um, tall growing, uh, cool season grasses. And then we have our sod formers, and those are grasses that kind of spread out, and they include things like Bermuda grass and Kentucky bluegrass, and they have structures called stolons and rhizomes, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. They grow along the soil surface or just under the soil surface, and they kind of fill in and make a nice dense sod in that pasture. So my, my point is, is that we can tell a lot about how to manage a pasture just by looking at the morphology of those grasses. If I have something that's tall and upright growing, like a bunch grass, 
That means that I can't graze that quite as close as I can something that has a sod forming growth habit close to the soil surface. Because a lot of that leaf area in a sod former will be close to the soil surface. So even if I graze it a little bit closer, it'll still have that solar panel that we just talked about. So just by looking at that morphology, we can tell how we should be managing that, that grass under grazing. Um, just a couple structures in general. Our, our cool season grasses like orchard grass and tall fescue will have a fibrous root system. About 90% of that root system is going to be in the upper 8 to 10 inches of soil. So it, in having that dense fibrous root system is important for grabbing water when it rains or fertilizer nutrients we put on the soil surface. But since it's only in that upper part of the soil, it doesn't give that, that plant a lot of drought tolerance in the summertime. So, so when it starts to get dry, uh, these will tend to show drought stress more than something that, like a legume that has a deeper taproot system. Ray kind of alluded to, to red clovers having uh, more drought tolerance, and it certainly does. Probably the most drought tolerant plant we have would be Ceresia lespedeza, which has a very deep taproot, and alfalfa, which has a very deep taproot. So they can go down and actually find water below the level of the root system in our cool season grasses. So that's a having certain legumes in your pasture is a good way to increase drought tolerance of that grazing system also. The other structures I wanted to talk about was rhizomes and stolons. And we often think of those as rooting structures, but they're actually modified stems. A rhizome will grow out sideways from the plant, and then wherever there's a node, a new plant can form on that, on that rhizome. What's a good example of a rhizome grass? Johnson grass. Good or bad? <laughs> you should work for extension. <laughs> it, it depends. It really does depend. If it's in my row crop field, then it's definitely bad, right? If I got it in a pasture or hay field, you know, it's not bad summer forage in many cases, if, if it's managed. So a stolen is the same thing, except it's, it's just above the soil surface. And a good example of uh, a spreading growth habit with stolons would be white clover. White clover will actually spread out and fill in the gaps in the pasture. It's one reason it's nice to have white clover in a mixture in a pasture. All right, and this is a Johnson grass rhizome and a white clover stole one here at the bottom. All right. Okay. So, so I've, I've got a defoliation event taking place here, and this, this is not a cow, it's my wife's horse, but but horses can graze really close, right? So if, if we defoliate this pasture and we want it to regrow, what, what do we need for it to regrow with? Time, good. What else? Sunlight, good. How does it capture its sunlight? Through residual that we leave in that pasture, right? So if we graze it closer, the regrowth is going to be slower. If we leave a little bit of residual in that pasture, regrowth will be much faster. So what do we need for regrowth? We need energy, and the energy is going to come from two places, right? It's going to come from sunlight, so that solar panel in that pasture that's remaining is going to grab that sunlight, turn it into chemical energy in the form of sugars and carbohydrates through photosynthesis. The second place it comes from is from stored carbohydrates within that plant. So the plants will actually store energy up or carbohydrates in that in that plant. So different plants store carbohydrates in different spots. And, um, and where it stores its carbohydrates at is going to impact management of that plant. For example, something like orchard grass or tall fescue store their carbohydrates in the stem base, so the, the, the base of the actual stem in the pasture. So what, what does that mean if I, if I graze a, an orchard grass or a tall fescue pasture really close, what am I doing to that pasture? Yep. I'm, pu I'm putting it at a disadvantage, right? Because I'm doing what? I'm removing all the leaf area, so I'm removing its ability to capture sunlight, and then I'm removing its store carbohydrates that are in the stem base of that pasture, in the stem base of that plant. So I'm kind of putting a double whammy on that plant, and that's really going to hurt a stand. Probably the best example of that is orchard grass and disc mowers, right? So 
There's nothing worse for an orchard grass field than a disc mower that's not properly set. We can mow so close with a disc mower that we can almost scrape the soil with it. And when we do that to an orchard grass stand, especially as we move into summer, we are going to significantly weaken that stand. If we do it three or four times, we're, we're probably going to lose that stand, especially as we move into the hot, dry summer months. So other grasses. Um, so I just want to mention where the carbohydrates are stored. So we talked about the stem base. Other grasses stored in stolons and rhizomes. Stolons and rhizomes are normally safely below the grazing height of the animal. So what that means is that even though we're grazing a little bit tighter with those grasses, those store carbohydrates are still there to fuel regrowth after that grazing event. Plus, we normally have a little bit more leaf area close to the soil surface with those species. So, so my point with this is not that we can't use something like orchard grass in a grazing system. We certainly can, but we've got to manage it a little bit differently. It doesn't tolerate that close and frequent grazing as well as something like Kentucky bluegrass or, or Bermuda grass would. I, I want to talk just a little bit about carbohydrate cycling in, in pastures, and I like to use alfalfa as an, ex, as an example. Alfalfa is 100% dependent on store carbohydrates for regrowth. So when I cut an alfalfa hay field, what's left in that field? Is there a lot of leaf area left? Just stems, but it regrows really fast, right? So it's getting that energy for regrowth from somewhere. In an alfalfa, that energy for regrowth is in the taproot of the, of the plant in the form of store carbohydrates or starch in that plant. So after, after that plant starts to regrow and we get fast regrowth on alfalfa stands, if we have moisture, of course, and um, we see a very drastic decrease, this is store carbohydrates in this line, a very fast decrease in store carbohydrates in that plant. And then all of a sudden they start going back up. So what happens at this point is that we're getting enough leaf area regrown on this alfalfa plant that it's able to meet its energy needs for growth, plus put the extra store carbohydrates back in, into storage in the taproot of the plant. And this is what we call the carbohydrate cycle. So we cut it, our carbohydrates go down, and then they come back up, and by the time we're ready to cut it or graze it again, we're back up to pre-cut or pre-grazed levels. All forage plants have a carb carbohydrate cycle. It's most pronounced in, in um, alfalfa, but all plants have that. And this is the whole basis of rotational stocking. If you understand what's happening in this diagram, you understand the whole basis of rotational stocking, right? So we graze our pasture, and then we rest it. We allow it to regrow and replenish those carbohydrates. That's what that rest period does between grazing events. What would happen if, if I came in here and, and I grazed my alfalfa off, started to regrow, got up to six inches, and I came in and I grazed it again. It probably won't kill it the first time, but it's going to drag these carbohydrates down even further when it tries to regrow. And then I do it again and even further. That's what's happening in a continuously stocked pasture. Every time that grass plant or that legume plant tries to grow, the animal's right there. This is my horse pasture. Grabbing that grabbing that uh, new growth off instead of letting it recharge its carbohydrates. And over time, we'll, those stands will get thin. What happens in a thin pasture stand? We get weeds, right? So, so the most important part of keeping weeds out of pastures is keeping a healthy sod to help exclude those weeds. This, this, is, this is one of my favorite diagrams, and, and I'm going to take just a couple minutes to, to explain it. This was from a publication by Dr. Roy Blazer. I, don't, I can't remember. This publication is probably about, I don't know, 40 years old maybe? Yeah, about 40 years old. This, this man, Roy Blazer, was at Virginia Tech, and he, he was a man ahead of his times in terms of grazing management. And this was one of the diagrams from a publication that he had, had written. And um, so we've got a, this is a tall fescue tillers. And um, he did two things to these tall fescue tillers. He either left two inches of leaf on them, and he did this in a greenhouse, or he, he clipped the leaves completely off the tiller. And then the tillers were either had a high carbohydrate status, and if you're looking at it, that would be on the left over here, 
and that would be synonymous with the rotationally grazed pasture where we rest our pastures and allow it to store those carbohydrates up, or they had a, a low carbohydrate status, which would be synonymous with a continuously stocked pasture where every time that plant grew a little bit, an animal was right there to, to nip it off. And then um, he clipped the leaves off, and then he let them regrow for a defined period of time. I can't remember what it was, but it doesn't matter. So uh, where we had a high carbohydrate status and we left two areas of two inches of leaf, we had an inch of regrowth in this defined period and four, four new tillers formed at the base of that plant. Now if we go to the other extreme where we had no leaf area left and it had a low carbohydrate status, we had half as much regrowth in that same time period and fewer than half as many tillers formed. I know there's a lot in that diagram, but if you kind of get that basic, you understand why it's so important to rest pastures between grazing events and not graze too close. We, we about doubled production just by leaving a, a little leaf area and resting our pastures between grazing events. This diagram kind of ties it, all this stuff that we've been talking about together, and it, this was one was from one of Dr. Blazer's publications too. So, we've got a pretty close grazing height here, represented by this dotted line, less than two inches. Okay, and um, what I want to do is just take a look at a couple of different grass species. So, if I look at orchard grass under a, at a grazing height, let's say an inch and a half or an inch and three quarters. How much leaf area is there left? Not, not much, right? And where's orchard grass storage carbohydrates at? The stem base. So I'm getting down into that store carbohydrates too. So this, this plant is not going to do well under close and frequent grazing because of its morphology. Now if I take something like Bermuda grass, on the other hand, under that height, I've still got quite a bit of leaf area below that grazing height. Plus, all of its store carbohydrates are in the stolons and rhizomes of the plant safely below the grazing height. So it's going to do much better under close and frequent grazing management. The same thing would hold true for, for Kentucky bluegrass. So does that mean we can't use orchard grass? Absolutely not. It just means we need to manage it differently than we would Kentucky bluegrass pasture or, or, a, um, or a Bermuda grass pasture. So um, the last thing I want to mention with um, forage plant growth is the impact that grazing management has on what's below the ground. We don't talk enough about this. Um, this guy, Kreider, and this was in the 1950s, did um, what he called a root growth stoppage study. And you can still find that technical bulletin somewhere if you like to look at it. But what, what he did was he imposed several treatments. So when he removed... 50% of the shoot. So if I had, if I had um, 10 inches of growth and I removed five, he temporarily stopped root growth. If he removed 90% of the shoot, so if I had 10 inches and I removed nine, he would stop root growth he found for 17 days. If he clipped that plant three times a week, that's exactly what we're talking about in a continuously stocked pasture. Every time it grows, something's there to eat that young tender vegetation off. Root growth never resumed. And if he took less than half, so about 40% of the top of that plant, root growth never stopped. And that's kind of where we come up with this idea of take half and leave half. So if I've got 10 inches of pasture, I don't want to graze it closer than five inches. And that's going to keep our root system healthy. So we can look at these three plants. This was probably managed under con a continuous stocking system, rotational stocking system, and then really not, not utilized all that much. The point that I want to make is that what we do, the top of the plant impacts what's below the ground. And that has a pro, thanks Ted, that has a profound effect on, on probably something that's really important to all of us, and that's drought in pastures. So when I have a healthy root system in that plant, that plant's going to grow longer into a drought stress and come out of that drought stress faster. That's one of the first things that people notice when they switch from a rotation, continuous to rotational stocking system. 
the first thing they notice is my pastures grow longer into that drought and come out of that drought stress faster. You know, I've, I've seen that multiple times this season. Uh, I've made several farm visits for NRCS to look at um, pasture damage from the droughts that we had, the number of drought periods we had this summer. And pastures that were managed well prior to that drought and not grazed too closely during that drought fared a lot better. So here's a couple real world, world examples of managing a botanical composition. And um, this first one is with nitrogen fertilization. So, so say I've got a mixed pasture. This is a mixture of uh, tall fescue and Bermuda grass. But we could replace this with crabgrass if you wanted. But it's a, a warm season grass and a cool season grass. And these are our growth curves. So this is when the plants are actively growing. Of course, our tall fescue is going to have more growth in the spring and then a secondary hump in the fall. And then our Bermuda grass or our warm season grass is going to be all tucked into the summer months. So say, for example, I want to shift this, this pasture towards Bermuda grass because I want more summer grazing. So with nitrogen, what I can do is I can come in and instead of fertilizing it in the spring, I put nitrogen on as we get into late spring or summer as the Bermuda grass really starts to grow. And that's going to push that growth of the Bermuda grass and, um, and be tougher on the tall fescue. Now, if I want to shift it back towards the fescue, then I would put nitrogen on in the spring, in the fall, when tall fescue is actively growing. The other way we can use nitrogen to shift botanical composition is to apply it a little bit later than we normally would. So say in April, mid-April or early May, and that's going to kind of push the tall fescue growth curve a little bit more towards summer. But just by how we put fertilizer on, we could impact the botanical composition of that pasture. Um, got five minutes left or so. Okay, this is, this is a nice example of a tall fescue white clover mixture. A lot of times white clover will become dominant in, in um, grass clover mixtures. And we need to think about why that is. Um, so if we have a pasture that's becoming dominated by white clover and we're getting a thinner stands of grass in it, we need to think about how we can shift that composition back towards that cool season grass, in this case, tall fescue. And, and we do that by raising the grazing height, right? So when we raise the grazing height, we leave more leaf area on that grass, and that's going to help shade that clover a little bit, and it's going to allow that grass to be more dominant in that stand. It, and that's a good way to shift it back just through management. And then we can put a little nitrogen on if we want to encourage grass growth um, in early spring or late fall to help uh, strengthen that grass stand. Now, if we want to take that same mixture and shift it towards white clover, and, and um, I had a good friend in Kentucky, uh, was my neighbor, and he was a really good grass manager, never grazed his pastures too tight, and he had a very hard time keeping clover in his pastures because his grass was so competitive. So if I want to shift this tall fescue clover mixture towards, um, towards the uh, white clover, then I graze a little bit tighter because the white clover will tolerate that closer grazing height and that puts that grass at a disadvantage because we're removing more of its leaf area and we're starting to remove some of the stored carbohydrates in the stem. And then no nitrogen fertilizer. All right, here, here's one. I know you guys are going to think I'm out of my mind, but there, there are about a half a dozen improved crabgrass varieties that you can actually... Um, buy seed from. And say I wanted to encourage crabgrass in a tall fescue stand so that I could have some summer grazing. So instead of planting, say, something like sorghum sudan grass or pearl millet, I would just uh, want to shift that composition of a cool season grass that's maybe thinning a little bit towards, towards crabgrass. And, and the way you can do that is, is ideally you'd broadcast, just like your frost seeding, a little bit of crabgrass seed on there. In, in late winter and then uh, drag it in or leave the livestock on it to walk it in a little bit. And then graze that tall fescue really close, especially as you get into late spring or early summer. And that's going to open that sod up and that's going to give that crabgrass a, a place to grow within that sod. And that's a good way to incorporate some summer grazing 
into your system. You wouldn't want to do this with every pasture, but maybe one or two pastures in your rotational stocking system. And that, that crabgrass will be productive from, say, June until uh, August, late August in that, in that grazing system. And then a little bit of nitrogen in late spring or early summer will, will encourage the crabgrass growth if you can afford the nitrogen. And then rotate based on the crabgrass in the summer months, not the tall fescue. All right, I think I'm going to stop there, Tad. And uh, Ray kind of covered uh, legumes and grassland ecosystems and, um, and frost seeding. Is there any questions I can answer before lunch? I know everybody's waiting for lunch. Yes, sir. I, I guess the two that jump out at me would be in, in, well, Edwin's probably a better one. Go ahead and answer that, Edwin, while you're there. <laughs> no, he's lying to you. He's going to correct me on the way home in the car. <laughs> but, but I would say when, you're, when your grasses are actively growing, so timing it with your active growth. So that would be, for most pastures in this region of the state, would be in late summer um, as we're starting to to get that second hump of growth in the fall or in in the spring. Um, yeah, yeah, I would say in March. So, so um, I haven't seen a lot of good data, and Ray can correct me, that, that dragging pastures actually improves productivity. There's a cost associated with that. If I was going to drag my pasture, the time when I would drag it would be as I was frost seeding that pasture. That would be the ideal time because you'll, you'll get a little bit of uh, soil disturbance to help incorporate that seed into the soil. But I just haven't seen a lot of good data that says that it's economically feasible to, to drag manure piles in a pasture. I know it makes you feel good, but, but I haven't seen the data. I, I haven't seen that data to, to say that it really is that helpful. Uh, you know, everything that we do, and we have to be very cognizant in grazing systems, everything we do comes with a cost. So if I'm pulling a drag across that pasture, I'm paying for my time in the, in the operation of that, that tractor and drag. I, I haven't seen that data to say say yes or no for sure, but um, yeah. So, um, other thing, one one other thing I'll just mention real quick, and um, is that in a healthy grassland ecosystem, you know, probably one of the most important parts of getting those manure pats broken down would be dung beetles. So I would encourage you to dig through your manure, and I know most of you probably won't do that, but to see if you have active dung beetle population on your farm. And then think about how can I manage my pastures to encourage that dung beetle population, which, which breaks the manure down and takes it into the soil. Dr. Womack? Yes, sir.
So, so the question is on managing Johnson grass and grazing systems, and that's a that's a tough question. Um, first, I'll just start out and say where don't we see Johnson grass at? In a continuously stocked pasture, right? Because why? Because it's 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 palatable, right? So they graze it continuously, and they'll graze it out of a continuously stocked pasture. Where do we see it at? We see it in hay fields commonly, and then rotationally stocked pastures. And that's one of the bad things about rotational stocking is that if you do have a Johnson grass problem, it tends to encourage that Johnson grass within that grazing system because it's giving it time to rest. Johnson grass likes to be defoliated and then rested between grazing events, and that's why it's so bad in hay fields. So the question comes to be is how, how do you manage that Johnson grass? I don't have a good solution, I'll tell you right now. Um, one, one potential solution would be managing it with some type of um, uh, herbicide application that would be uh, just for the Johnson grass, and I don't know if we have anything, Ray, that's labeled for pastures. I, I don't think we do. The, the second way would be to apply a non-selective herbicide to just that Johnson grass, and you would do that after you graze through that pasture and you have a height, height differential, so with a weed, with a wick or a weed wiper. I don't, Dr. Besson, do you have any comments on that? Did I see him here? Yeah. And, and that's not perfect. It, yeah. But it's an added cost. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your attention. I've enjoyed being with you today. And I'll be here through this afternoon. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Do you, do you want me to mention that real quick? Okay. All right, I didn't have this on the agenda, but I had a special request. And I do take special requests. And um, I, I just wanted to tell you real real quick about a um, study that I've got a, a student and my technician working on now. And um, it, it's a, a fall nitrogen fertilization study. So the turf grass guys have known for a long time that applying a little bit of nitrogen in the fall enhanced green up in the spring of turf grass and um, thickened stands up. In, in the forage guys, you know, of course, are a lot slower than turf grass guys. And um, there, there just wasn't a lot of good data on potentially applying some nitrogen in late fall, so say around Thanksgiving, on what happens that next spring. And so I had a, a graduate student and my technician took the project over this last year and what we did was we went in and we applied either no nitrogen in the fall, 30 pounds of nitrogen, 60 pounds of nitrogen, or 90 pounds of nitrogen. Now, we probably would never apply 90 pounds of nitrogen in the real world, but we wanted to bracket that response. And then we looked at growth that following spring. So what we found that following spring, even with a normal spring fertilization, so we come in in March and put down um, 80 pounds of nitrogen, additional nitrogen over everything in the spring. Where we applied that fall nitrogen, the plots greened up earlier, they had thicker stands, and the response to the fall nitrogen was about 20 pounds of dry matter per unit of nitrogen um, applied. So we got a significant response in that spring. The reason I'm telling you about this study, well, Tad asked me, but the, the other thing is, is if you have a pasture that's kind of thin and needs to be thickened up a little bit, a little bit of late fall nitrogen could be beneficial um, to get that pasture off to a good growth in the spring. Now, the economics are not real good when nitrogen price is a dollar a pound. But when it, when it comes back down and starting to decrease down a little bit, it, it may make economic sense.